one. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, so we're recording. That's great. Um, I have a couple of announcements. None, none as terrible as last class, so don't worry about that. Um, I have been uh, in contact with Natalie, and I think she's uh, healing up pretty well. Um, I did want everyone to know, uh, I started grading uh, a couple days ago, uh, well, right after I talked to you all. Um, and uh, if you have uh, an extension in place with Natalie, uh, I have that information now, and I should be able to, um, you know, honor that. Um, if there's any discrepancy in the grading where, for example, maybe you agreed with Natalie that you would have an extension and then I don't give it to you for some reason, um, that would be a, definitely a good thing to send me an email about because I understand that there's just a couple of wires crossed with all this, nat you know, with Natalie being out. Um, and so if I know that you have uh, had an arrangement for an extension, I'll definitely honor that moving forward. Um, I also wanted to... Uh, let you all know that um, Zin Chen will be starting on Friday uh, in class. And I think that uh, a couple of you asked about Zin Chen's uh, contact information. So I will be sending that out to the class sometime later this afternoon. And I'm just going to send it to everybody because it's easier for me to do that. Um, so uh, yeah, that's kind of like what's up with that. Does anybody have any questions about that whole situation or kind of anything related to end of the semester stuff? Okay. So great. Um, well, uh, today, as promised, we're going to be talking about uh, interaction. And we're going to be interacting in this class mostly through the keyboard and the mouse. Um, we'll also kind of reinforce some of the code techniques that we've already discussed. Um, we are heading into uh, another week of lecture uh, where we will focus on uh, a couple more kind of uh, maybe uh, advanced examples and then we can also, um, bop. Um, I also have a slideshow of what people are doing with different sort of types and classes of algorithms that will be on the final exam. Um, so, uh, also, don't forget the final exam is on May 11th. Any questions? Comments? Okay. I just had this, um, like, fan I have this, you know, I think it's pretty like normal for, especially normal for artists to have like fantasies just as you're going about your daily life. And usually I fantasize about interesting stuff, but just now I fantasize that there would be like a huge urn of coffee, like, and that I could just get a tube and like, um, that would be, that would be really nice, wouldn't it? Um, but sadly, sadly, it's not to be today. Um, but yeah, it's the end of the year. It's the end of the year, y'all. And uh, I don't can only guess that you're feeling a little frazzled. Um, it kind of goes with the territory. Um, you know, if you need anything or you need uh, assistance with anything, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk mostly about um, interaction issues today. And so I have a few sort of code examples set aside. Um, I think one of the first things we'll talk about is actually using um, a math, um, math function. So in this example, these are the code examples, and I'll just kind of rebuild these um, as we go along. Um, this example basically uh, takes rotation and applies the rotation in a way that sort of syncs it up um, with the, the mouse. Um, and so that uses... Um, a pretty, like, mostly straightforward um, techniques that we've already kind of thought about, such as um, the for loop and uh, some basic rotation. Um, if we turn off this portion right here where it's uh, rotating, you can see, obviously, that turns the rotation completely off. Um, but what is actually going on here with this rotation? Well, what's going on, and we'll, I'll look at this, uh, I'll show you this in a different context because I think it would actually be probably a little bit easier to kind of grok or understand. 
Um, the, uh, the map function takes uh, one uh, variable, in this case, mouse x, and then it uh, takes one range, in this case, zero to width, and then it compresses that range to, right now, it's basically putting up a, a number between negative 0.05 and positive 0.05. So I'm gonna kinda come up with a whole other uh, way of dealing with this. So I'm just gonna do a little bit of surgery on this example, um, and hopefully we can get this into um, well, something that'll be maybe even a little bit more visual. Um, so right now, it's just the same example. It's just pasted into a different tab. Um, okay, so that's fine. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna not do the rotation for this particular, um, for this particular example. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of the rotation part. Um, I think I'm just gonna come up with a, like a slightly different problem. So I think it would be really cool and this sort of also like picks up back uh, off where we were on Monday. I think it would be really excellent if we could find a way to get uh, this thing to iterate entirely through the color spectrum and that it started on one side and ended on the other side, okay? So I think definitely using HSB color would be a good way to get started for that. Um, so we could start off with a little bit of success here. So I'll use the color mode function. And as I promised, we'll do HSB. And I think I'm gonna go for um, 255 uh, as far as the sort of like top uh, value. The only reason I'm using 255 is that I suspect that there might be more than 100 um, items here. I don't know, I have literally no idea. Um, so now at this point, all we're really thinking about is uh, a fill. And so we can certainly go ahead and just as kind of a placeholder, we can give it maybe something like red. So in that case, we would do something like zero, uh, 255, 255. Um, and so that's grabbing that uh, one end of the spectrum, which is red. And what we're really, I think, hoping for is probably to put some kind of a variable in here so that we can change it around based on this for loop. Um, also, if I'm looking at this just right now, it looks like our rectangle is drawn at I, I. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, it just makes it, um, it makes it uh, a little bit more interesting to probably think about the math. So I would potentially change this to zero, um, and that will make it just a straight horizontal line. And then I get just I'm gonna do one more thing to kind of make myself happy here, and that is that I'm gonna translate it to uh, zero height divided by two. And by doing that, it'll just center it vertically on the, on the screen. Um, probably here, we should think about whether this really needs to be zero. It might be something more like width. Even worse. Let me think about this for a second. Um, let's see, we're starting at zero, navigating to, through to height. Let's use width, just as. Um, so this is the part where like having coffee would be really helpful. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just set that there. And so um, this translation is uh, probably doing almost exactly what we ask it to because it would be helpful to have a push and a pop. Um, and it just so happens that I have one uh, a pair kind of commented out here. So um, the reason that, and it's very similar to the issue that we were experiencing with rotation uh, for the last two class days, I think, where if you translate and then in the next frame you translate it again, um, what you're basically doing is something like, okay, this is zero, zero, 
And then if you tell zero, zero again to go to the same location, it'll be here and it'll just go off into infinity, right? Because it's kind of constantly applying that transformation. So by using push and pop, we're basically able to reset it. And so I do think I actually want this to start at zero um, because I want it to go from the edge of the screen to the other edge of the screen. So that's great. So now I sort of have this thing. And if I wanted to sort of really think about how to explore the color spectrum, uh, first I'm just going to clean this up like a teeny tiny bit because I've got some of this other stuff in here that we don't need so much. Um, I'll keep the rotation variable in there for now. Um, so I'm just going to get rid of some white space too so you all can see what's going on on the screen. Da -da. So let's say, for example, we wanted to take this uh, zero point for the fill, which is the hue, and we wanted to create that hue in a way that goes through the color spectrum. So we could probably use I um, if we wanted to. Uh, that's only a partial solution because you can see what's happening here. Um, it's a partial solution in the sense that it kind of does what we want it to do, but it doesn't do it in the way that we want it to actually do it, which is for that spectrum to go all the way across the screen, right? So the reason that it's not working right now is because we are uh, using the values for i, and i is going from zero to width. Um, just to refresh everyone's memory, our width right now is set at 400. And what did we make as the top of our color range? Well, we made the top of our color range 255. So you can see here, like really easily, our color is capping out here at 255. So uh, one thing that I think I would like to do is to print mouse X to the uh, console, just so we can kind of verify yeah, as promised, that's right there is 255x, right? So the question becomes then, how do we kind of fix this or how do we get it to sort of embrace the you know, full set of coordinates that we have access to? I'm gonna show you one like really uh, potentially easy way to do it and I'm gonna show you a potentially hard way to do it. Um, so the potentially easy way to do it is to just increase your range um, to the full size of the, the thing. Now, it looks like that kind of messed something up, but it didn't. If, if the color range of the HSB palette right now is going from zero to 400, it actually makes um, the, back, the call to background kind of a middle, in the middle of the range when it used to be near the top of the range, right? So personally, I guess I find it kind of like counterintuitive to deal with color in a way where the numbers go over 255 because I probably have just my own, you know, uh, familiarity, right? Like color is almost always in that sub 255 detail range. But this could totally be a workable solution. You would just have to push this closer to 400 and then you would get something that looks like that. And then you would also push these um, high points up to 400. And you could get something that looks pretty good. Um, what's, sort of, what's the wrong, what's the potentially like very wrong thing about doing it this way? The code police are not going to come after you. I can absolutely guarantee that. Um, the only thing that I could see that could maybe happen that wouldn't be so great about doing it this way is that if you then change the, um, the canvas size or if you change the color range, it could be really difficult to like get your sketch to function properly. So that's not a huge deal for some people. I'm going to take it back to 255, though. And I think I'm going to give it a white background. And I'm also going to change these two parameters back to 255. And I'm going to show you a different way of doing it. Um, and that is by using the map function. And so what we're basically going to do is we're going to take i, and we're going to use this syntax right here. Hello, birdie. So cute. Um, I hope they're not in the ceiling. Um, 
Anyway, um, so this is basically how the map function works. And uh, so you start off with a value to store, and in this case, I think we could probably say something like, um, let, I'm actually gonna do this up here so it can be a so-called global um, data type. So I'm gonna say something like h equals zero up here, and this is basically like our value, our variable for the hue. Um, and then if you come in here to actually use the map function, you would do it, it would be something like h equals mm, map, and then we're mapping i in this case, and then it's sort of laid out in this comment. So the value to convert is i, the low current of the current range and the high current range is zero to, to 255. And then we also have this other range which is zero to 400. Um, and so basically what it's doing is then we also wanna make sure that we apply H in this uh, call to the fill method. So sometimes I get these flipped. I'm just gonna flip these values. I'm not 100% sure why that is. There we go. So in this case, the target range is the range that I'm actually looking for, which is that 255. Um, and so, yeah, so this is basically getting us kind of all the way there. Um, now, if we wanted to come in and kind of bring back some of this rotation that we had in the example previously, we could certainly do that. So I would probably take away, like comment out this call to push and comment out this call to translate and also comment out the call to pop. Um, and that should get us back up to the top of the thing. And then also if we wanted to make this diagonal again, we could uh, just use uh, I in place of Y here. Um, so we're getting back there now. And if I'm just gonna steal this one little example, which is um, basically using the map function to also map the rotation. Um, and I guess one of the reasons why I wanted to do it with the color is because I feel like it's a much clearer example than doing it with rotation because like 0 0.05 versus negative 0 0.05, like those are not not like I'm an expert on this particular thing, but those don't seem like very relatable numbers to me. <laughs> so um, yeah, I just think uh, it would maybe be, make sense to make it a little more common sense example. Um, and then we definitely also want to rotate it with the rotate function. Um, so we can put that back in there as well. So, in terms of interaction, we're sort of really using like the most uh, simple kind of type of interaction, which is mouse interaction. Um, it seems like, you know, you may say, oh, mouse interaction is simple, but you can do a lot of really complex stuff with the mouse and the sort of using a pointer or a cursor. Um, as you know, like the mouse is basically constantly, you know, recording coordinates. Um, and you can use those coordinates for pretty much whatever you want. You can draw shapes on them, you can, um, you know, lots and lots of different possibilities. Um, in terms of this example, I think we're probably ready to put it to bed, um, but I will go ahead and save this. Um, so this can be like the new, well actually, hang on just a second. I think I will just overwrite this old one so that way I don't have to relink it. Um, so yeah, this is sort of a partially review, but also I wanted to introduce the map function. Um, so one of the things that you'll have to start thinking about when you get into inter interaction um, is that um, if you look at the slides that I prepared for today, um, I kind of scrolled through um, and selected some functions from the reference that I thought would be really useful to everyone. Um, so if you look at the last few slides in particular, 
Um, these are all the slides. These are all uh, the functions that if you click on them, it'll go straight to like a reference page in the reference manual. But these are basically all of the different ways of dealing with keyboard and mouse interaction that we would potentially talk about in class. But they're also just sort of linked here. So if you wanted to you know, find a quick example on that reference page, you could do that. Um, this is not like that kind of end sum of all the ways that you can interact with code uh, via your mouse and keyboard. These are the most popular methods that you know I think are the most sort of reusable in other languages and the most useful. Um, so let's go ahead and kind of jump into this. So. Um, I have this uh, example here, which looks like it's kind of a lot, but it's actually really not that much. Um, so I'll kind of walk you through it. So what I have here is I have a couple of uh, variables. Um, I might not have probably talked about this at length. I know I've probably mentioned it several times. Um, it is, if, unless you're doing something like using a for loop or an evaluative uh, statement inside of an if statement, it's a really good idea to declare all of your variables uh, up here. And by doing that, I'm gonna throw like a computer science word at you. By doing that, you're creating a global variable. And what that means is that that variable is gonna be accessible from any other location of code in your program. If you, Let's just say, for sake of argument, we declare x and y uh, in setup. Now, I'm not saying that you can never uh, declare variables in setup, but if you do declare these in setup, what's the big, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that if you declare these in setup, you will not be able to access them through draw or as part of the draw loop. So that's one of the reasons, especially when you're first starting out, I would just recommend using all global variables. Um, you, you may have opportunities to use what are called local variables um, later on, uh, but I feel like it would just kind of complicate things unnecessarily. Um, but I do think you definitely need to understand that if you are inside of a function, whether it's mouse clicked or draw or setup, if you declare variables in that function, you will not be able to use them outside of that function. They, they become kind of like dead to the world. Um, that's at least how I think about it. Um, so yeah, just something to kind of keep in mind for the future. So, as I said, I kind of uh, created all my variables up here, and I have a couple that are kind of like self-explanatory. So X and Y are sort of the er self-explanatory variables that we've dealt with. What do they stand for? They stand for X, and they stand for Y, um, meaning that those are coordinates on the X and Y axis. So I, in general, I feel like those need no, you know, need no translation. Um, the background, I actually uh, am just using that as a placeholder for the background value um, right here. So I could maybe add a comment that this is actually the background color. That would be kind of useful. And then I have two other variables. I have a, a variable for counting clicks. Hmm. And I have a variable for fill. Um, and so that variable for fill is set to be uh, black right now, um, especially um, because we have no color mode set, we're working in RGB. Uh, RGB 255 is our default there. Um, so yeah, that would be just fine. Um, also, uh, one thing that I wanna mention as we're getting into more advanced sketches um, in the next couple of days, you might, think about uh, using a different screen size um, or using a different window size. And um, over here in Create Canvas, you can certainly just take this number and make it go up. So we could draw it at 600, 400. Um, you could draw it at really any size you want. Um, probably the most common size that I work in for like actual apps 
or actual like interactive websites would be 1920 by 1080. That also, you may remember that number from when we worked on video. That's like the equivalent of an HD video. Do you want to set your screen size to 1980 by 10, 1080 in, a, in an environment like this where you only have half the screen? I can't say I would recommend it. Um, probably it's gonna be frustrating. So I would, I would just come up with some size that you like. Um, but I would know that if you get deeper into doing development and you get especially deeper into doing graphics development that you, know, you could potentially be working in a situation where you have um, P5 code in a text editor and then you're opening it up in a, in a web browser at full screen, right? Um, so that's what you could potentially work towards. Um, and that's actually what we cover. Uh, we're covering that right now actually in my advanced 309 code class. Um, but yeah, I would think that that's like kind of outside of the scope of what we're doing in this class, but if you're interested in going a little bit further, it's definitely possible. So I'm gonna leave the window size, um, maybe I'll size it up to like 600 by 600 just so it's not so small and depressing. Um, and uh, yeah, I also made some uh, little, I positioned X and Y at the center of the screen uh, here. And then, let's see what's happening here. If I just go ahead and go to the draw function, um, it looks like I have, I have this red line that I've drawn and then I have a rectangle that um, is basically, uh, you know, in the same location, uh, the rectangle is what's being stroked in this case. Um, and I have a fill that's set to this fill color value and that's, that's pretty damn straightforward, like uh, at this point, within the draw loop. So what is all this other stuff that's down here? There's all this other stuff. Um, these are additional functions that you can use outside of the draw function that add interactivity to your sketch. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull some of this stuff out of here. Um, so here um, I'm using the mouse clicked function. And the mouse clicked function is one of those deceptively, uh, deceptively simple functions. So what does the mouse click mean? Well, uh, it definitely, that's the mouse pressed, which is a different function. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that just so we don't get tied up here. I'm also just gonna comment the key presses out too because we, we just wanna focus on this one thing. So let me turn that on again. So what the mouse uh, clicked function is, and it's really important to kind of think through this, um, when you start coding, you may, have gone through your entire life like not reflecting on what a mouse click actually is. Hi, do you have a question? Yeah, actually, uh, when I did the value equal to zero in uh, the de uh, declaring the variable part, uh, it says you have used the p5.js with the uh, function values. Make sure you change the function name to be zero. But that does not show what you are actually doing. Which zero are you referring to? Could you give me a code line? Let first one, let value equal to zero for me. I think that's what it is. You probably have some other pro problem in your code. Are you looking directly at the, at the example? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with this code, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, if you, in general, if you're experiencing a problem like on the first line of the code, that can sometimes be uh, an indication that something's wrong with your last line um, at the bottom and it's just sort of cycling back up to the top. That would be something to look at, yeah. Is anybody else having that issue who's on the example code? Okay. Um, again, if it's, a, if, it's an, if it's an issue that like multiple people are having, I'm happy to stop and like figure it out, but I, th I think it might be specific, sorry. Um, okay, so 
as I was saying, uh, yeah, we're definitely uh, thinking about this mouse clicked function. And mouse clicks are sort of like water, right? Like fish don't think about the fact that they're wet and we don't think too hard in our daily lives about what constitutes a mouse click. Um, we just do it, right? And we do it like millions of times a day, potentially. <laughs> um, so a mouse click, it's important to realize about a mouse click that a mouse click is actually like a meta uh, state of multiple states. So within a mouse click, you have mouse press, you have potentially mouse drag, you have mouse released, and all of those things combine to make mouse clicked. So um, there are, depending on different programming languages, specify mouse interaction a little bit differently, but P5, as far as I can tell, has four distinct mouse states. Um, and also, a really common sense way to think about this is if you look at any software or look at anything on your operating system, on a web page, whatever, if you click on something, that is not the equivalent to clicking on it. So basically what I did is I just pressed it, but I didn't release it. That's a press, that's not a click, right? So it is important to kind of like think through and be specific about what types of interaction you actually want. If you want it to be a drag, if you want it to be a press, if you want it to be a press and a release, that's a click, um, and some other things like that. So that's one of those things that you probably haven't thought about, but if you start you know, doing web development or graphics development or UI UX development, um, it would definitely be like at the forefront of your mind. And so it looks like here, I'm just gonna run this one more time, we're using the mouse clicked function and I have not, as far as I know, I haven't actually clicked in here yet. Um, okay, well, I did, I used the console. So it's basically doing two things, it's adding to click and it's printing the click value. So right now, if I have, this is fresh, if I go ahead and click in here and I'm clicking anywhere in the window, so that first click, it turns to one. And then I also had this if statement that says basically, if the click equals one, turn the color white, right? So this is like kind of the most bare bones way you can do this. But by the way, this code, you could use this interaction code and literally do whatever you want with color or whatever's in that place you could put Something like, I don't know, draw a bunch of shapes or, you know, draw some cat with weird, weird things. Um, so let me go ahead and pull the other uh, else if statements out. So we're using those else if statements. Um, and the reason I'm using the else if statement rather than the else is that uh, by using the else, else if statement, you have the opportunity to actually give it a, a specific target and then say, if it does this specific thing, do this specific thing, right? So let me try it one more time. I'm just gonna go through these. This is one and then this is two, so that uh, click plus plus is adding to the value there. And this is three and then we also have a value for four and then I believe at the end, uh, the sort of else condition, which is literally anything else, um, it goes to value and it also resets the click to zero. So we can start over um, at one, okay? So the resetting of the click to zero is just this one little line right here. It's not super complicated as far as that goes. There are probably harder ways of doing it. Now, that's clicking, and definitely one of the reasons we, did, we went ahead and used these variables to count the clicks is because we wanted something to happen other than just one thing happening when you click. If you wanted to set it up so that only one thing happened when you clicked, um, you basically would just, um, let me show you how to do that real quick. I will just uh, comment out everything except for the color change. 
So if you came into this and you only wanted, every time it clicked, you wanted it to turn white? Done. Um, that's a lot you know, simpler and straightforward. Now, potentially, is that, like, what would be some other ways of getting out of that? You could potentially, I guess, reset it back to zero. Um, so one thing in UX UI, which is sort of what we're doing, um, one thing that can be really helpful is the idea of a, uh, a Boolean variable, which is a variable that's either true or false. And so we could uh, definitely make this variable set to false here. Um, and so maybe something like here, we could say, hmm, um, I'm just going to grab this little if statement and put it up here, comment you out. So I could say something like if clicked equals false, then switch it to white. Uh, and then maybe I could also have um, an else statement that puts it uh, to black. And then one, one other insurance policy here to make this work correctly, I would want also clicked to um, mm, to go back to true. And I want to actually, cha I'm completely changing my mind on this. Um, let's change it back to false. And uh, so here we'll say clicked equals true. So um, one thing that I'm looking at right now is that probably this should be an else if, um, and I should check to make sure that clicked is false. Okay, so I'm guessing that this uh, clicking, making the click true every time the mouse clicked is, um, is not necessary. So let me just, oh boy. I need coffee. I'm really bad at logic when I don't have coffee. That's hard. Um, so, okay, so we're starting off click equals false, right? And so here we're saying if clicked equals true, then yeah, okay, the problem here is that clicked never equals true. So probably flipping it true here should help. Okay, that got us our white stuff. And then I think here we would also want to probably turn it false. Much better. So clear as mud, right? Um, so let me just go over that one more time. Um, so basically what's happening um, is that we started off with uh, the click value equal to false, meaning that it starts off, it, it has not been clicked, right? So it goes into this uh, mouse clicked function. This mouse clicked function, by the way, is automatically uh, automatically sort of activated anytime there's a, a mouse click. And we're basically saying, okay, if clicked equals true, then flip the value, take the value white to white and make it false. Otherwise, 
if it's false, make it true and make it also black. So that's why it toggles between those two states because it's constantly turning itself true or false. Um, okay, so let's go to the next part of this sketch, which is the, um, I'm just gonna leave all of these sort of options in here and you can toy with sort of commenting them or uncommenting them as you like. Um, so we, I feel like we've pretty like reasonably covered this idea of mouse interaction. Um, there's a lot more to say about it, but certainly I feel like we have the basics down. Um, the next thing I want to make sure that we have spent some time talking about is the idea of having a keyboard. Um, and by the way, you may think that a keyboard is an extremely antiquated uh, input device, but I do just want to point out to you that if you use P5 sketches on, let's say, something with a screen-based keyboard, like an iOS device, um, a screen-based keyboard works from a code perspective exactly as a physical keyboard. So um, there's no sort of like, you know, penalty to using the keyboard. You, on pretty much any device, you should have access to a keyboard. Um, so we're using the key pressed function, which the key pressed function is activated if any um, specific key is pressed. So really, ooh, I deleted all of that stuff. Um, so really what you're asking for when you run the key press function is you're kind of asking the interpreter, the compiler, have any keys been pressed at all? Um, and that's the question that you're asking. So then you have to kind of drill down a little bit further to say like, okay, well if some keys have been pressed, are they the keys that I am looking for? Um, and that's why we have this series of if statements. And so here, um, we're using a couple of different methods of syntax, and the up, down, uh, left arrows are key codes um, that are, have very specific names, right? You can see they're highlighted in, in yellow. And the uh, regular keys, and what I mean by regular keys are like numerical, alphanumeric keys, um, those keys are going to be specified in terms of characters with single quotes. And they will also, instead of using key code for those, you would just use the syntax for key. Um, and so I'm not gonna kind of like go through these like ad, ad nauseum because I feel like this is extremely similar to the code that we just looked at. But I am gonna kind of go through uh, the sort of large strokes here. So the C key, for example, um, we'll go ahead and do this little click thing. Okay, that was fine. So now what happens if I press the C key? Well, you can see, uh, no pun intended, oh, that was awful. Um, sorry, that, that got even me. Um, you, uh, you may notice that um, the uh, C is printed to the console and our background did indeed flip to 255. So just a quick reminder that the reason that this works, the reason that any of this works is because we're actually using this BG value way up here in our draw function right here, right? So if that were not part of our draw function, we wouldn't be able to kind of like have that relationship where things happen in the key press function and then things are reflected in the draw in the draw function on the screen. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the other couple of things. So there's one thing that I want you to notice about the C key that's kind of a special bit of syntax that would potentially uh, be important to let you know. Um, it seems pretty clear that here we are referencing uh, both the capital C and the lowercase c. Um, does anybody have a pretty decent idea of why we might do that? It's a phenomenon called user proofing your code, um, which is that users, and when you're a coder you can start saying things like this, users often don't know what they're doing. Um, and I'm, you know, obviously I don't really think that, but it is kind of true, um, tiny bit true. 
Um, so yeah, when a user comes to your website, they have no idea if they have their caps, lo caps lock on. Or So a, a lot of programming is actually just kind of trying to anticipate what people might not even be real realize, what people might not realize that they're actually doing with their computer. So it's a pretty solid convention in coding that you always sort of, uh, when you're using keyboard interaction, that you always sort of opt for both cases. Um, and even with numerical ca uh, keys that you would also, you know, use the and symbol and the seven symbol or whatever. So, so that's just kind of a convention. And we're using also logical or here, um, not logical and, because if we used logical and, what would happen? If we did that and, and thing? Well, absolutely nothing would happen because if we, we can't, you can't have the caps lock on and the caps lock off at the same time, right? So using the or operator here makes a lot more sense. It's like either or, right? So we also have a few things going on here with the up arrow, the down arrow, and the left arrow. Um, and basically what we're doing in that case is we're just adding, um, we're adding, uh, we're adding X and Certain keys are adding Y. The up and down key are, is adding Y, and the left and right key is adding X. Could we do this in a slightly less like boring way? Uh, sure. I mean, we could maybe have it go like 100 pixels instead of 10 pixels. Be a lot more exciting. Um, but yeah, that's basically how uh, how this function works. And then I also do want to point out to you that there is this bit at the bottom here. Um, this is called uh, return false. And that is something that is a nice thing to do if you have a series of else if statements because it basically gives you an option to do nothing if nothing of those, nothing, uh, none of those conditions are met, basically. Um, so, yeah. And then lastly, I think we could probably talk about this on Monday. Um, we will talk about dragging stuff around. In case anyone is possibly feeling slightly dragged around, you know, by the end of the semester, we'll, we'll bring it home. So I think that's pretty much uh, where we're at for today. Um, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions uh, or if you need any assistance. Okay, thank you.